you say they never saw this coming, well, you're not alone. Million dollar renovations to a happy home. My ex said she gave me the best years of her life. I saw a recent picture of her, I guess she was right. I wake up, access to the damages. Checking media takeout. Bitches of me drunk walking out with a bitch. But it's blurry enough to get the fake out. I wake up, all veggies, no eggs. I hit the gym, all chest, no legs. Wait Wednesday, baby. Then I made myself a smoothie. Yeah. Then me and wifey make a movie. Chicago, St. Louis, St. Louis to Chicago. Underlay, underlay, E-I-E-I -E -E -I. Uh oh you had me driving fire enough to switch the time zone You was the best of all time at the time though Yeah, you wasn't mine though But I still drove 30 hours to you Yeah, I still drove 30 hours to you Yeah, baby I usually open up the show with a song that's been in my head all day. That was, that's not an example of that. I, I kind of just was thinking of a song I wanted to open the show with. Is there a rule that I have to open the show with a song? I like to. I think it's a nice touch. I like to, of course, you know, have some form of copyright infringement on my video. I mean, I would hate to see my videos be pushed in the algorithm. You know, so why not bump some Kanye? What was that? Life of Pablo, I believe. I think that's the the most recent album that I like really listened to of his like through and through. I, I remember I think I, I think I was a little bit high. This is years ago. This is probably five, six years ago. I was a little bit high, which is a rarity for me. And I was just sitting at the computer. I think Eric was here as well. And I was just sitting right in between these two speakers, just yeah, yeah, oh, oh. I was like, wow, the production on here is magnificent. Um, and I still, I still believe that. Uh, good song. Once again, a little Kanye. They call him Yay now. That's another thing like X that only conservatives do. Only conservatives call Kanye Yay. Uh, it's, it's, it's cringe, guys. Twitter is Twitter, it's not X, and Kanye is Kanye. Uh, maybe not the best artist choice to open up the show with a day after uh, my first ever <laughs> addressing of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, but, you know, maybe that's why it was in my head. My subconscious does the most sometimes. Maybe that's the reason. Anyway, my name is Jimmy Seleski. Happy Wednesday to you. Uh... It's not Wait Wednesday today. I mean, it is Wait Wednesday, but it's not Wait Wednesday because I don't have any gym topics to talk about. That was kind of like a flyby. Maybe eventually I will have gym stuff to talk about. Uh, not today. Uh, today, I think today of all days after what we saw last night, we got we to gotta talk a little bit about the buzzer beaters that happened last night. For those of you who, who follow the Rook Look segment that I always close out every uh, one of these with, um, we had two bets last night. Uh, one was the Cleveland Cavaliers NBA game, minus four and a half against the Mavs. I can't believe I didn't realize that you could call that the Cavs versus the Mavs. Like, I, I, was, I was doing my little write-up this morning. And by write-up, I mean just looking at the score and typing that in on my show notes. I don't do a write-up. It would actually be pretty embarrassing if I did do a write-up and, like, scripted this show and this is what I came up with. <laughs> I am happy to say this is not at all scripted. <laughs> and I'd like to believe that if it was, I could do better than this. Anyway, I actually had a little bit of regret that I didn't say Cavs versus Mavs. How do I miss that? Anyway, that bet didn't hit. That's not the point. But... Max Struess. Any name with a ooh, you know you're getting the big fucking Struess juice. <coughs> he hit him with that Struess juice last night. It was pretty sweet to watch. Uh, so with this game, we we had Cavs minus four and a half. Um, they did not cover that. They won by two, but they did it in magnificent miracle fashion. They were up towards the end of the game. Well, they, they, they were down with like three or four minutes left when I checked in after grocery shopping at my usual hour of 9 p.m. 
Um, and then they took the lead with like a minute or so left, and then it's just classic basketball fouling here, back and forth, blah, 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 blah. Um, Dallas winds up back in front by one point with like two seconds left. And their only hope is a, you know, buzzer beater three. And this is what we got. Pretty cool to watch. If I can pull it up. There we go. Let's get it back to the beginning. Check this out. You can't have anybody get an easy shot. Kleba has that tip by Mobley. All right. So this is where Dallas takes the lead. So now they're winning 119 to 118. And... Booyah! Do you believe this? Tell me that's not sick. So Dallas takes the lead with like two seconds left. Struce inbounds it. Guy passes it back to him. And he sinks it. Nothing but net. Nothing but net. From, from beyond half court. That's pretty sweet. And this guy looks like a celebrity. What celebrity does he look like? Look at this. At the end of the ball game, the Cavs needed to go all the way. I mean, I guess he is a celebrity. He is a professional athlete from well behind in the NBA. But I mean, like a real celebrity. Perfect. Can you believe that? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Nothing but net swish. Sit back and enjoy it, Cleveland. He was red. I mean, this guy was was lit afterwards. You could tell he was just stoked beyond belief. Who does he look like? Somebody tell me in the comments who he looks like. Uh, it's like an actor or something. Like a Hollywood hot guy. A Hollywood hunk. Um, so that was sweet. We didn't win the bet. They only won by two as a result of that three. So we still lost, but that kind of made up for it. Um, however, we did win the Nevada bet. Nevada. I noticed that the East Coast, we we say things like Nevada, Colorado. We say auto, auto. When you get out to the actual place, they say Nevada, Colorado. And I hate to say it, guys, but the East Coast is right. These uh, words, I believe, are rooted in Spanish. Um, Nevada might come from the Spanish word nevar, which is to snow, I believe. Um, and Colorado probably has something to do like colored. <laughs> they got to change that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, in Spanish, you would say Colorado. You would say Nevada. You wouldn't say Nevada, Colorado. So um, we're right. You're wrong. You guys don't say your state correctly. Now, I know coming from Maryland, that's uh, saying a lot because uh, technically we would be Maryland, but clearly, clearly we're not going to say that. Okay, there's a difference. Um, anyway, Nevada, Nevada and Colorado State did hit the over, which is crazy to watch. But n more importantly, we covered in amazing fashion. So check this one out. This is Jared Lucas of Nevada. So Nevada's pretty much winning this entire game, mind you. I'm going to start this clip a little earlier. I'm going to play it back from where uh, they're obviously in that classic thing at the end of a basketball game where you just foul incessantly. It's kind of ridiculous, but I get it. But it is ridiculous. Like, it's just like you just purposely foul and stop them free throw so you can get the ball back and stuff. It's kind of it's kind of crazy that that's a part of the sport, but it very much is. And um, they foul uh, this dude Jared Lucas, who's like a ninety one percent free throw shooter, um, and he he misses both, which gave Colorado State a chance to come back, which they did. And that is where I will bring you in. Here we go. So this is him missing that first one. 
And then he misses the second one. Boom. Colorado gets that. That's not even the buzzer beater shot. That's just a good shot. And now they're tied up 74-74, 2.2 seconds left. Yeah, I already said that, dude. Thanks a lot. So now they're in a timeout, wherever. And so here we go. Inbound. Boom! Off the glizzass! Now this guy's... This guy's not nearly as good looking as the other guy. They do look similar, though. This guy's like a weird creepy 90s version of the guy and he's probably not he, I'm, I'm not saying he's a creepy guy but he is rocking a goatee which I gotta say I gotta say it's it's not a good choice it's not a good choice uh some of you may remember a couple weeks ago I was growing a beard or had I had had a beard um and um I I originally had this idea where I was going to have a beard from Thanksgiving through St. Patrick's Day. So basically the winter season. And then St. Patrick's Day to Cinco de Mayo, I would grow a mustache. And then Cinco de Mayo until Thanksgiving, clean shaven. And my thought process there was, you know, if I can sport different looks, why not? And also I would time them with, you know, things seasonally make sense it gets cold in the winter you grow a beard st patrick's day you, you you need a mustache for that if not that then at least single de mayo so you might as well get that started and then clean shaven for the summer you know um and also I, I i would say that you know that way if anybody took a picture of me i would immediately know when they took it, it could be any year oh look at this picture of you from 2025 and it's like 2080 I'm fucking 88 years old. I'm like, what? I see this. Show it to me. I'm like, oh yeah. Must have been April. <laughs> Must have been April, I say, because I'm wearing a mustache. Um, but I gave up on it because the the fact of the matter is, guys, I can't grow a fucking beard. I can grow somewhat of a beard, but this section right here just will not come in. Like this cheat, this like jawline part here. And it just, it just, you know, it just wasn't my look, I don't think. So I shaved it. and But before I shaved it, I, I, I tried to shave a, I tried to sport many different styles because that's really the only time you actually get to do that. You know, when you have a full beard, obviously when you're shaving it down, you're going to just check in to see, does this look good on me? Does that look good on me? Maybe a soul patch, maybe a goatee, maybe a mustache, maybe this, maybe that. I'm going to go with no to all. None of the above. I shaved in a goatee, and I swear to God, I am still disturbed by the thought of it to this day. I really thought that I was going to go look good with it. The reason I thought that was because it was the best section of my beard that I could grow. Like, the mustache down here and the chin are solid for me. Like, I crush it with that section, the goatee. My cheeks are my weakness. My cheekness. But this section, and I thought, that must be God telling me. This is nature's way of telling me, if you're an atheist, nature. This is nature's way of telling me, the universe, saying, Jim, you were born. You were born to have a goatee. And uh, so I shaved it in. And uh, turns out I wasn't. I was, I was actually born, I think, to never have a goatee. Uh, it wasn't even close to a good look. It wasn't even questionable. I creeped myself out. I looked at my profile saw my side view in the mirror and and imagined someone else looking at me down the bar and I thought 
to myself that I myself was a creep. And I know me. And I thought I was a creep. Much less somebody who doesn't know me. It was so not a good look. It's kind of weird that like hot guys in the late 90s and early 2000s rocked that look. Um, But, and I'm all about, like I like bringing back old retro styles. Like I rock sideburns, you know? I guess that's kind of retro. I don't rock the big 70s sideburns, but like these are kind of like 90s sideburns. If you look at like 90s guys, they would kind of have like the, the kind of thin sideburns a little bit. That's kind of my, my game. And I think that's cool. Um, but some styles just don't need to come back. And But the thing is, some pe- some dudes look good with it. Like some guys can actually rock it. I think black guys look good with goatees sometimes. I don't know. There's just certain stuff, you know, um, but not me, not me. So yeah, I brought that up because this guy has one and which is a rare sighting for someone that's like 22 to just be rocking a goatee. But anyway, um, it feels weird to open up the show with sports. I almost regret it. I almost regret it. Um, let's dive into some more things that actually matter, supposedly. Uh, the Michigan primary happened last night. The primary election. Uh, that was, of course, the Democrats and Repubs. Um, Nikki Haley is apparently still running. I thought that she was, like, done. Uh, did, she got like trounced in South Carolina like four days ago and all everybody was saying was like, no, she's completely fucking done. One of her biggest donors pulled their funding. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know why she is still running. I speculated on a lost episode that I don't believe was ever released that I put out right after the New Hampshire primary uh, that... She is a double agent for the Democrats. And then I I kind of second-guessed that theory as time went on, but now I'm starting to un-second-guess that. Because the big thing about New Hampshire was, if you recall, um, it's a, it's a semi-open primary state. And on this lost episode, I went pretty far into detail kind of explaining the differences between a closed primary state like my home state of Maryland, uh, a fully open primary state, and a semi-open primary state. A closed primary state means you can only vote for the party that you are registered, uh, to which you are registered. So if you're a Republican, you can only cast a vote in the Republican primary. If you're a Democrat, you can only cast a vote in the Democrat primary. If you're unaffiliated, like myself, you cannot vote. That's how a closed primary works. An open primary, which are kind of odd, if you ask me, but maybe there's some rhyme or reason to it. I don't know. I'd be interested to hear what it is. Um, An open primary doesn't matter what your party affiliation is. If you're a registered Republican, you can either vote for the Republican Party or the Democratic Party candidates in the primary. You can only cast one vote. So if you're a Republican and you decide to use your vote in the Democratic primary, that's your vote. You don't get to also vote in the Republican primary. But you can vote for whoever in whatever party you want. A semi-open primary like New Hampshire and several other states, um, if you're a Republican, you cannot vote in the Democrats. If you're a Democrat, you cannot vote in the Republicans. But if you're unaffiliated, you can vote either. So basically, uh, undeclared voters, as they call them, uh, have the option to vote in either the Democrat or Republican party. Again, you only get one vote. But you're not bound to one party or the other unless you're registered to that party. So a Democrat can't vote in the Republican party. But undeclared can. Um, And that was significant because what we saw in the uh, 
New Hampshire primary was that Nikki Haley got like something like 40 percent of the vote, which seemed which seemed like way too much. Donald Trump still won handily with like 60 something percent, but Nikki Haley got like 40. And you're thinking about that. You're like, are you telling me that uh, three, two, two and five Republicans in New Hampshire would rather have Nikki Haley than Trump? That doesn't sound right. And uh, you'd be correct because that's not the case. Um, the Republican voters overwhelmingly voted for Donald Trump. Donald Trump's votes were majority Republican voters. Nikki Haley's votes were 75% independents, as they're called, or, or as some people call them. Uh, so Nikki Haley wasn't getting the Republican vote. She was getting the independent vote. Now, it's also important to note that Joe Biden was not running in this primary. Uh, Joe Biden's campaign announced that they would not be entering into any primary races until South Carolina, which was uh, um, at the beginning of this month, February 3rd. So Iowa, New Hampshire, they did not participate. So there really was nobody to vote for in the Democratic primary. Joe Biden wasn't running. You could write him in. And then there's obviously always going to be a couple random minor candidates. Um, but for all intents and purposes, there was not a Democratic primary. Joe Biden won it by write-in, but who cares? Didn't matter. And the reason I speculated they did that was because you have uh, South Carolina, which, um, correct me if I'm wrong, has a very large uh, pop, uh, proportionate population of, 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 uh, a large black population, um, which I believe is Joe Biden's strongest base. I think probably in large part to his affiliation with Barack Obama. Um, but regardless, I suppose the Biden campaign uh, uh, assumed that they would perform very well in South Carolina. So they wanted Biden's first entry into the primary cycle to be a stellar performance. And the way they were going to do that was not enter until they were uh, in a state that they knew they would perform very well. Um, but going back to the Republican side in New Hampshire, um, one could speculate that since uh, there really was no use for a vote in the Democratic primary in the state of New Hampshire, that Democrat-leaning voters would instead use their vote as a vote against Trump in the Republican primary, meaning a vote for Nikki Haley. Um, and this could be used in the same way, in the same way that the Biden campaign chose not to enter the primary cycle until they could um, be in a state where they knew they were going to perform very well. And that way, the optics of the campaign look good because your first real results look great, you know, as opposed to having some you know, shitty performances in, in less favorable states where people start to wonder if your campaign is, is suffering or not. Um, in the same way, those votes could then be used to potentially undermine Trump's campaign in those same states to make it appear as if the Republican Party or the Republican voters are not as unanimous behind Trump as you would think. And it almost worked on me because when I simply heard those numbers with no other context, I had a hard time comprehending how Nikki Haley got such a large portion of that vote. But once I looked into it more, 
it makes perfect sense. And the fact of the matter is that the Republican voters, the Republican base, is pretty much unanimously behind Trump. Not totally, but pretty virtually, let's say. Um, and going beyond that, I then speculated that Nikki Haley is only in this race to undermine Trump's campaign. Now, the reason I've kind of walked that back, I haven't walked it back. I just have kind of like not, I, not really thought about it too much recently. And the reason I haven't is because she's not really putting up any level of competition or threat. So if she is there to undermine his campaign, it's not really doing that much. So then maybe there is no bigger plan to it. You know, or you would imagine that if there was a bigger plan, it would be working better. But that's not necessarily the case. You know, there's a lot of things going on right now, as we discussed uh, last week, I believe, uh, with court cases and things like that, that, um, you know, they're not really having that much of an effect, but damn if they aren't trying. So the fact that Nikki Haley's, you know, show campaign to undermine Trump is still ongoing in much the similar fashion in the 2016 race when you had freaking 11 Republican candidates on stage for the, for the Republican primary when Trump had long been the, the clear front runner. But they just, the Republican Party didn't want Trump, they wanted somebody who's a party member, not some guy who just is not and coming in and just hijacking it, basically. So they did everything in their power to undermine his campaign by putting him up on stage with Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, all these people. I can't even name Ted Cruz, just like people that didn't stand a chance after a while. Um, so that could be going on now. But back to the Democrat side, I, I did find one thing I came across today, and the person I was listening to kind of said it very much in passing, uh, but I, I was kind of hoping they would spend a little bit more time on it because it stuck out to me as something potentially a thing. I don't know. And that was... Um, with this Michigan primary, Joe Biden received 81.1% of the vote for a total of, so far, it's like 99% reporting or something. I, I don't think they ever say 100% reporting. I bet you if you looked up the 2020 election results, it would probably still say 99% reporting. Of course, in that case, it would be true. Um, uh, but yeah, so... With 99% reporting, Joe Biden sitting at 81.1% of the vote in the Democratic primary uh, for a total of 623,415 votes. Um, that earns him 115 delegates. Um, interestingly enough, uncommitted, which is an option in this state, as well as several other states, um, and those states are Kentucky, Maryland, Rhode Island, Tennessee, and Washington, and also Colorado offers voters the option to vote for a non-committed delegate. So I don't know how that, I don't know why they needed a separate sentence for that. Clearly I was reading there. That's not how I talk, but, um, let me get back to where I was. Yeah. So there were 101,436 uncommitted votes in Michigan. That's 13.2%. Now, in order to get uh, actual delegates sent to the Democratic Convention, uncommitted delegates, you need 15% statewide. Um, however, if you earn more than a certain percentage in any given congressional district, uh, you will earn delegates for that as well. So they actually did manage to earn two delegates that will be sent to the Democratic National Convention as uncommitted, which is something... Um, 
I guess that's not the big, I mean, look, first of all, that in and of itself is a thing. Um, and if you listen to political media, um, particularly on the conservative side of things, you will hear them talk about that. So I'm not saying anything new by bringing up the amount of uncommitted votes that came in the Democratic primary. That's not necessarily breaking. It is something. Um, given that on average, over the years, we've seen usually anywhere between 10 to 20,000 votes come in for uncommitted. So right now, we're looking at about five times the amount of uncommitted votes uh, in Michigan that you'd regularly see in a Democrat primary. Um, Marianne Williamson, your mom's hot friend, uh, and uh, Dean Phillips, who's just, uh, I don't even know enough about him to, to make fun of him. Um, they got three and 2.7% respectively. So really the second most powerful com uh, candidate in this primary was no one. <laughs> Literally. Literally, the second most popular candidate in the Michigan Democratic primary was no one. Nobody. Zero. Um, but again, that's something that people will talk about. What I found even more interesting was this little tidbit, which is, remember that number Joe Biden received, 623,415 votes. Now, if you go through the previous presidential primaries for the Democrats in Michigan, you will see, um, you know, like 2020, that was a pretty big turnout for the, for the primaries. Um, because the Democrats did not have a person in power. So generally what you noted that I think the 2020 primaries were Biden versus, I believe, uh, Bernie primarily um, was, was his main contender. And so you have a large, large turnout um, those years when, when the party in question does not currently have an incumbent president. But on years that the party does have an incumbent, somebody that's already in office, the primaries are less of a thing, and so you expect far less of a turnout. For instance, this year, Joe Biden is the clear candidate for the Democratic Party, as far as anyone can tell. Um, there really is no significance to these primaries outside of just like numbers analysis like we're doing right now. But nobody's sitting here wondering if he's going to win. Uh, that's not necessarily the case in 2020 with Biden versus Bernie. It wasn't the case in 2016 with Bernie versus Hillary. The last time we can point to being in a similar situation, meaning a Democratic primary where one of the candidates in that primary is an incumbent president. The last time that situation has existed was in 2012 where Barack Obama was the incumbent running for his second term and I'm looking at the 2012 Michigan primary election results for the Democratic Party and I'm showing that 194,887 total votes were cast on the Democratic side. Of those, 20,833 were uncommitted and 174,054 were for Barack Obama. Why do those numbers stand out? Well, Right off the bat, you'll notice that when Barack Obama ran as an incumbent president in 2012, 
he received just over 174,000 votes. Now, I think it's probably safe to say that Barack Obama is a far more universally appreciated president slash Democrat figure in the Democratic Party in particular than Joe Biden. I think most voters, you would be very, very hard pressed to find a Democrat voter, even a Democrat, anyone really, but let's just keep it to Democrats. You would be very hard pressed to find a Democrat who would look you in the eye and say, I think Joe Biden is better than Barack Obama. And I'm actually more enthusiastic about Biden and his message and his policies than I ever was about Barack Obama. I believe that Joe Biden is far more uh, invigorating and, and tapping into the hearts and minds of people and mobilizing them to vote and inspiring them to get out and make. I don't think there's really many people that would say that. I think that's a safe assumption. Yet, in 2024, the incumbent president, Joe Biden, receives four times, just about, four times more votes in the primary than Barack Obama did when he was in the same situation as the incumbent. Now, there are no major internal party threats to Joe Biden. Those are typically the things that would drive a high election turnout, as I mentioned before, in years when there is not an incumbent. And the reason we're going all the way back to 2012 is because this is the most recent comparable Democratic primary. Clearly, there is a much larger turnout when there are two viable candidates competing for a position that neither one of them already has. This is a situation where there really is no competition in the Democratic Party. No one else of any mainstream uh, uh, level has announced their candidacy and is posing any type of opposition to Joe Biden. So why is it that we're seeing such a large mobilization of votes four times more than Barack Obama received in 2012 when he was the incumbent running against no one? Why is it that we're seeing 670-something thousand for Joe Biden yesterday? Well, I have some ideas. Thoughts. Not even ideas. Let's just, let's just talk about that. What, what could cause that? Well, here's a thought that I had today when I learned about this. If you entertain the mere possibility that something below board could be going on in these elections, if you just allow yourself to even entertain the possibility, which, in my opinion, you should. If you're, if you're sitting here staunchly saying that never in my life will I ever even consider or even entertain the possibility that there could be anything below board, anything shady, anything corrupt interfering with our election process. Well, That's not like a great way to be, in my opinion. You're just 100% sure that nothing like that could ever happen in this country. Like I said before, I'm sure you could recognize it happens in other countries. I'm sure you can recognize all those things. But for some reason, you just absolutely will not even discuss the possibility in this country. Okay, fine. I've lost you already. You've probably turned off this show a long time ago. For everyone else that is just willing to simply entertain the possibility. We're looking at something here that stands out, in my opinion, mathematically stands out. 
And that is that an incumbent Democrat president received four times as many votes as the most recent Democrat uh, incumbent president in 2012, who was, by all accounts, far more popular, far more popular. If this vote count was reversed and Barack Obama received 670,000 votes in an incumbent primary, while Joe Biden received only 170,000 in his incumbent primary, I would believe that because I think that Barack Obama is easily four, five, 20 times more beloved in pop culture than Joe Biden. I think that goes without saying. But that's not the case. No, what we're seeing is that Joe Biden has managed to earn four times more votes than Barack Obama did in the same position. Well, here's, here's what I'm thinking. Bear with me. Here's what I'm thinking. If we entertain the possibility that there's something going on below board, we must first consider two things. The first thing is you can't suppress the vote nearly as easily as you can dilute the vote. This goes in many ways back to our conversation about taxes versus inflation. Um, if you go up to somebody and say, hey, we want to pay for this billion, multi-billion dollar program and all these benefits and all these expenditures and all these things, and to do that, we're going to have to tax you 20% on top of what you've already been paying in taxes. People would reject that outright. Dude, you're not taking another 20% of my paycheck. Fuck no. The other way is to dilute the value of your money. So I can either actively suppress you by taking money out of your bank account, or I could dilute the value of the money in your bank account so that it has the same net effect without you really catching on as quickly. So instead they go, okay, well, we'll just fucking print a bunch of money to pay for these programs. And now that money in your bank account is worth 20% less, as we discussed. So I bring that up to reiterate, it is easier to dilute than to suppress. You can't stop people from going into the booth and voting uncommitted. You cannot stop Democrat voters from going out and saying, I am not happy at all with the way things are going. I'm a Democrat voter, but I don't really, I'm not really behind Biden. I'm not happy with the way he's been handling things. I'm not happy with where we're at in this presidency and as a country. So I'm going to vote uncommitted. You can't stop them from doing that. I mean, you could, but it would be way easier to be found out. It would be way more noticeable if you simply just either, I guess the... I mean, you can't just physically, it, where are you going to, you can so you, I guess you would just have to like not count them or, or ignore them or whatever. So you can't do that. So you have to accept that there is going to be uncommitted votes. Also, you have to know that there's going to be a lot. Five times as many, actually, as we saw last time in a incumbent Democrat primary. Five times as many. So what can you do instead? Well, sir, we wanted to tax the people 20% more, um, and they said no. We, they're not letting us raise taxes. Well, fuck it. Just print more money. Dilute their money instead. Oh. The only way that we can make a hundred thousand uncommitted votes look not that significant is if Joe Biden manages to have 700,000 votes to himself. Close to. Now, I'm not saying that is what happened, but I am saying if you follow the trends we see 
the the average amount that you would you should expect. So that's our baseline. That's our that's our frame of reference. Okay, extremely popular presidential candidate within the Democratic Party in Barack Obama. And his ratio to uh votes for him and uncommitted was about 7 to 1. He got like 170,000 votes for himself and like 20,000 uh, uncommitted. So more than that. More like 8 to 1. But even with that, he still only managed 174,000 votes. That's our frame of reference. 198,000 total votes. Why is it that we're seeing 700 something thousand votes this year? Nobody's running against Joe Biden. What was driving people to come out in those numbers? I mean, these numbers are closer to a non incumbent year primary in the state of Michigan. The normal amount of The amount of votes that we saw in 2012 totaled under 200,000. The amount of votes we saw in 2016, 2020, when there were two viable candidates running against each other, non-incumbent, they got closer to like 1 million, 1.1, 1.2 million total. We're sitting at around close to 800,000 That's much closer to the 1 million or so that we'd expect in a a real year versus the less than 200,000 we saw with an incumbent in 2012 in Barack Obama. It's much closer to the higher end. Why? Well, a theory, I'm not saying it's my theory. I'm not saying it's the truth. But a theory is that the Democratic establishment fully recognize that there is a large contingent of the Democratic base that does not support Joe Biden for a variety of reasons. There's the people that don't support his handling of the Ukraine thing. There's people that don't support his handling, per, most probably most importantly, with the Israel thing. The more, the more progressive wing of his party wants him to be more you know, pro-Palestine, whatever. There's a whole bunch of different reasons for not supporting him. And they all exist, and they exist in large numbers. And so they had to figure out a way to contend with the fact that we were going to have a lot of people voting uncommitted in a state that allows that, like Michigan. So how do we contend with that? Look, In a state that doesn't allow you to vote uncommitted, Joe Biden is essentially running uncontested. There is no other viable candidate. So what most people will do if they don't support Joe Biden in those states, which is the majority of states, they just won't turn out to vote. However, in the few states that do allow you to vote for literally no one, like cast, not just not vote. No, your vote is for not anyone on that list. You can cast a none of the above vote. And that's just what it is. And instead of giving that person a delegate that will cast a vote for him at the Democratic National Convention, you will instead send an you will instead send an uncommitted delegate to the convention who will I guess vote for whoever. But you are making a statement when you vote none of the above that I'm not giving my support to any of these candidates. So in the case of this primary election, In a state like Michigan and the several other states I mentioned, voters can actually go out and vote against Joe Biden in a race which he is uncontested. And so in those states, I'm just saying, let's keep an eye out from here on out. I already told you the states that that where where this situation exists those being uh, Kentucky, Maryland, Rhode Island, Tennessee, Washington, and sometimes Colorado. 
apparently. I don't know why they put that in a second sentence, like on its own. It's like the why of the vowels. A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Colorado. Um, but let's just see if we can notice uh, maybe uh, uh, if, if we start to see more and more disproportionate outsized voter turnouts um, in those particular states where uncommitted voting is allowed. Um, because to me, the pattern already exists. If you go back to 2020, one of the key things that I, I have consistently pointed out uh, on this show and everywhere is the fact that both presidential candidates, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, received more votes than any other presidential candidate in the history of the United States. More than Barack Obama, more than Bill Clinton, more than JFK, more than George Washington, more than anyone, both of them, Joe Biden and Donald Trump were both the two most popular presidential candidates, apparently, that have ever run for president in this country. Okay. Now, in order to achieve that, you, of course, need or would have to just assume a tremendously large voter turnout because you cannot have two people receive more votes for president than anyone else ever in the history of elections while not having the largest voter turnout in general in the history of elections. That doesn't mathematically make sense. So to me, that kind of rhymes a little bit with our current scenario now, which is, again, we can't stop the fact that more people are going to come out and vote for Donald Trump than they did even in 2016. We can't stop the fact that he just received more votes than any other presidential candidate in history. So you're telling me we have to win this election while our opponent breaks the record for most votes ever received for president? Well, we'll just break the record more. Again, we can't make him not have votes, but we can make our guy have more votes. We can't suppress the vote, but we can dilute it. And I'm not saying that's what happened. However, if it did happen, that would be why and that would be how. So, without getting any deeper into that, without jumping the gun, let's just leave it at, look, I think to me, it's fairly obvious uh, that at the very least, the number of people voting for Joe Biden being four to five times larger than the number of people voting for Barack Obama in 2012 in a similar position is odd. It makes you hopefully want to look into that. When you look into it and you see that there are 100,000 uncommitted votes, you have to imagine that those are real votes. Unless there's someone out there manufacturing uncommitted votes, which if we're going to entertain the possibility I just laid out, I guess we can entertain that too. Um, but that's not where I'm leaning. Where I'm leaning is shit. We're only expecting about a 200, 300,000 voter turnout for this election. I mean, in 2012, we only had 200,000 people vote total. Obama got 174,000 of those and the rest were uncommitted. Um, 
I feel like there could easily be 100,000 people in this state that are going to vote uncommitted. Uh, And if that happens, then we're looking at potentially as many or more votes for none of the above than Joe Biden himself. And the optics on that are horrendous. So we cannot let that happen. We can't stop the people from voting uncommitted. But we also cannot allow for the uncommitted vote to represent a a large, if not majority portion of the voter turnout in this state where that is an option. So a potential solution is we dilute those 100,000 uncommitted votes with more votes for Biden. How many votes would it take to make that 100,000 not look like a big deal? How many votes would it take to make five times more than you ever see uncommitted look like not a thing? Make people just turn a blind eye to it, move on. And that's exactly how many votes he got. Again, I'm not saying that happened. I'm not saying anything more than I mean it could have. So let's keep an eye out. Let's see if th- let's see if this type of thing continues. And if it does, then we'll continue talking about it. If it doesn't, then I guess I'll go fuck myself. I don't know. I'm looking at the numbers. Doesn't add up. Sue me. What do you want me to do? Tell you it does add up? Because it doesn't. Anyway, uh, moving out of that, uh, that was surprisingly intense for a Wednesday. Huh? Uh, Closing out. We already did sports earlier, so we might as well close it out with the Rook look. Let you get back to your lives. A couple bonuses tonight. Uh... I'll get the boring ones out of the way first. Uh, DraftKings has a uh, first 10-minute goal uh, for the St. Louis Blues and Edmonton Oilers game, hockey. Uh, It's boosted from minus 175 to plus 100. So that's a pretty sweet deal. Um, It's a bet that is probable to hit. Apparently, much more probable to hit than not, according to the Vegas lines. So getting that at plus 100 is a pretty sweet deal. So I took it, and I recommend you take that as well. I always take those boosts. They, they are pretty good. I've compared, you know, obviously, DraftKings tends to inflate their favorite line much higher than a different book would. Like, they're like, oh, look, it's normally minus 175, and now it's plus 100. Then you go to, like, FanDuel, and they have it at, like, minus 145. So like DraftKings does it on purpose because boosted from minus 175 to 100 looks a lot more of a good deal than minus 135 or minus 145 to 100. But the point being is regardless, anything below minus 110 boosted to 100 is is a positive EV bet. So uh, I, I lock it regardless. Um. Also in the hockey on MGM, there is a 25% NHL boost. I really, again, I don't pay attention to hockey. I don't know what to tell you. I'm just making you aware that there is that boost. It's uh, I, I put mine on the Blues money line. I don't fucking know. I just figured if I'm going to be paying attention to a game, I might as well just pop it on that game too for the Blues to win. They're heavy underdogs, plus 240. I boosted it to plus 100. This is not, that's not an official pick for the Rook look. Um, maybe it will be if it wins. Like, uh, no, it's not going to count. You guys throw that on whatever you want. You probably know more about hockey than I do, if you know anything at all. Um, and last but not least, certainly not least, the clash in the court is back in back in action. I'm so happy about this. I, I, I was I was I was getting nervous that they were done with it because they went a couple days without doing it. Um, but tonight's game 
is Auburn at Tennessee. That's going to be a good game, dude. Tennessee is good, and Auburn is good. That's a good game. Um, and I'm thinking Auburn. I'm thinking Auburn plus seven and a half. Uh, Tennessee is a better team on paper. I think they're a top tier team, actually. Um, but Auburn is good as well. And the thing is, although I do have Auburn as the underdogs in this game, in my model, I only have them as like four and a half point underdogs. And that is with a boosted home court advantage for Tennessee. My flat model has them as like three, three and a half point underdogs, but I went ahead and tossed Tennessee an extra like point and a half on top of the average three and a half point home court advantage because I think in a game like this at a top tier, you know, big powerhouse program like Tennessee uh, where the people are going to be going crazy and it's a, you know, top 25 ranked two teams going at it there's that that home court advantage is going to be significant i think so i went ahead and tossed them basically a five point home court advantage for tennessee and i still have them as only five and a half point underdogs so i mean i don't know what else to tell you plus seven and a half to me seems like a steal it might not even be that anymore it might have actually moved because it was looking like it was about to move to like plus seven or something like that. It might still be sitting there, but I would say anything over plus, uh, realistically, as I've said to you multiple times before, any boosted bet is positive EV. And I'm going to add to that as long as you place it before, right before the line closes. If you get the closing line that close at minus 110 and boost it 50%, then you've nailed it. That's a positive EV bet. You got a minus 110 at plus 140, essentially. Um, The only way that doesn't work is, like I said, if you do it too far ahead of time and you lock in plus seven and a half at uh, at minus, at at boosted to plus 140, and then the line moves to plus 12 and a half, well, now, yeah, you got got a boosted bet, but your spread is, you, you lost to the closing line by five points. So, you know, Everyone else got plus 12 and a half and you got plus seven and a half, but you got it at plus 140. That That's a case where it might not be positive EV. That's also a very extreme example. Um, but like I said, in general, you know, if, if, if you look at the books and the line has moved more in Auburn's favor and now they're sitting at like plus six and a half or whatever, and you're thinking like, well, he said plus seven and a half. Look, just wait till the game's about to start. Lock in Auburn at whatever they're sitting at assuming it's not going to be that far off from seven and a half, but even if it is, whatever, boost it 50% and profit. Okay? So those are your picks. Yes, goal in the first 10 minutes for the Blues-Oilers hockey game and Auburn plus seven and a half versus Tennessee for the clash on the court boost on DraftKings. Folks, see you tomorrow. Peace.